Hello, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Tenani. Last time, we talked about the gang stalker's illusion of omnipresence. I gave some tips on how to break the illusion and discussed how gang stalkers try to make others think that a T.I. has a mental illness. Ready for more? Let's go. T.I.s, it's time to know thy enemy. from Beware the Covert Aggressive Personality by George Simon, PhD. The Covert Aggressive Personality employs a potent one-two punch. The Covert Aggressive conceals aggressive intent to ensure you never really see what's coming. And he or she exploits your normal sensitivities, conscientiousness, and other vulnerabilities to manipulate you into succumbing. Covert aggressive personalities are the archetypal wolves in sheep's clothing. These individuals are not openly aggressive in their interpersonal style. In fact, they do their best to keep their aggressive intents and behaviors carefully masked. They can often appear quite charming and amiable, but underneath their civil facade, they are just as ruthless as any other aggressive personality. They are devious, underhanded, and subtle in the ways they abuse and exploit others. They have usually amassed an arsenal of interpersonal maneuvers and tactics that have enabled them to effectively manipulate and control those in relationships with them. The tactics they use are effective because they simultaneously accomplish two objectives very effectively. The tactics conceal obvious aggressive intent. When the covert aggressive is using the tactics, the other person has little objective reason to suspect that he is simply attempting to gain advantage over them. The tactics covert aggressive personalities use effectively play on the sensitivities, conscientiousness, and other vulnerabilities of most persons, especially neurotic individuals, and therefore effectively quash any resistance another person might have to giving in to the demands of the aggressor. So it's this one-two punch of the tactics, never really seeing what's coming and being vulnerable to succumbing to them, that's at the heart of why most people get manipulated by them. Aggressive personalities that use such tactics to bring potential adversaries to submission are anything but passive in their interpersonal styles. Yet for years, many have erroneously applied the label passive-aggressive to such behaviors. As you can see, covert aggressive personalities are very different from passive aggressive personalities and they are anything but passive they are very actively aggressive personalities who know how to keep their aggressive agendas carefully cloaked dealing with them is like getting whiplash you don't know how badly you've been taken advantage of until long after the damage is done. They are perhaps the most manipulative of all personalities with the possible exception of the psychopathic or sociopathic personality. Gang stalkers use covertly aggressive tactics to harass TIs. These stalkers get off on getting other people angry. They congratulate each other if they say hi to a 
STI and the TI looks annoyed. They think it's hilarious and that they beat a TI because they cough when a TI walks by. They impressed their friends by trying to record TIs using the bathroom. They bond with their mates and children by trying to walk into a target in the street. Sometimes they get really romantic and do this while holding hands. And then they look at the TI and say sorry with a sneaky smile and smirk. Aww. <laughs> right. All this is mostly done by people who are supposed to be adults, believe it or not. Any relationship that involves harassing other people during time spent together is not one anybody should be jealous of or want. TIs report that they have been harassed by couples. If a couple's quality time involves harassing people, it means that there is something wrong with the relationship that the couple is ignoring and is instead taking the frustration out on an innocent outsider. Some parents actually get their kids involved in gang stalking. There is something wrong with the parenting skills and family values that are being taught to these children. Maybe these parents should try to raise their kids to be productive members of society who respect other people's rights. Just a thought. Hmm, I wonder what they say after a gang stalking incident. <laughs> Good one, mom. <coughs> <laughs> Did you see his face? <laughs> he was so mad when you coughed. <laughs> you are so romantic. Oh, baby. I liked how you just turned around and started telling that girl off or pretending like you weren't even talking to her. That was sexy. You are so spontaneous. Girl, the way you just shouted curses at him, then drove away so he couldn't say anything, Show me you know how to stand up to people. For real. <laughs> Dad, you're my hero. You are the man. The way you just looked at her, then said goodbye, and started laughing, classic. I wish I had that much courage. My parents say it's OK to pick on someone as long as everyone else is doing it. They are like the best parents ever. <laughs> Now it's time for FYI, essential information for TIs. Gang stalkers use covertly aggressive tactics to manipulate TIs. A TI needs to be aware of the process of victimization as well as defense mechanisms and offensive tactics that could be used to cause them harm. You're about to receive some information on how to handle this right now. TIs face constant emotional and psychological attacks. It is important for TIs to maintain their emotional health. The perps are watching the TIs every move and waiting for the slightest sign of anger to come rushing in and attempt to increase it to uncontrollable rage. In this context, uncontrollable means you are no longer in control, but they are using the rage to control your actions. Don't think that one or two annoying events is what they're banking on. No. They rely on cumulative anger building into rage. They are trying to wear down your resistance with every incident, even the minor ones, until you have a little resistance and lots of stored anger. You can prevent this from happening, but first let's discuss the process of victimization. The following is an excerpt from the book In Sheep's Clothing by George K. Simon. The process of victimization. For a long time, I wondered why manipulation victims have a hard time seeing what really goes on in manipulative interactions. At first, I was tempted to fault them. But I've learned that they get hoodwinked for some very good reasons. A manipulator's aggression is not obvious. Our guts may tell us that they're fighting for something, struggling to overcome us, gain power, or have their way, and we find ourselves unconsciously on the defense. But because we can't point to clear, objective 
evidence that they're aggressing against us, we can't readily validate our feelings. Two, the tactics manipulators use can make it seem like they're hurting, caring, defending, almost anything but fighting. These tactics are hard to recognize as merely clever ploys. They always make just enough sense to make a person doubt their gut hunch that they're being taken advantage of or abused. Besides, the tactics not only make it hard for you to consciously and objectively tell that a manipulator is fighting, but they also simultaneously keep you consciously on the defense. These features make them highly effective psychological weapons to which anyone can be vulnerable. It's hard to think clearly when someone has you emotionally on the run. Three. All of us have weaknesses and insecurities that a clever manipulator might exploit. Sometimes we're aware of these weaknesses and how someone might use them to take advantage of us. For example, I hear parents say things like, yeah, I know I have a big guilt button. But at the time, their manipulative child is busily pushing that button. They can easily forget what's really going on. Besides, sometimes we're unaware of our biggest vulnerabilities. Manipulators often know us better than we know ourselves. They know what buttons to push, when and how hard. Our lack of self-knowledge sets us up to be exploited. 4. What our guts tell us a manipulator is like challenges everything we've been taught to believe about human nature. We've been inundated with a psychology that has us seeing everybody, at least to some degree, as afraid, insecure, or hung up. So, while our gut tells us we're dealing with a ruthless conniver, our head tells us they must be really frightened or wounded underneath. What's more, most of us generally hate to think of ourselves as callous and insensitive people. We hesitate to make harsh or seemingly negative judgments about others. We want to give them the benefit of the doubt and assume they don't really harbor the malevolent intentions we suspect. We're more apt to doubt and blame ourselves for daring to believe what our gut tells us about our manipulator's character. Manipulators often try to know their victims better than the victims know themselves. Fortunately, it doesn't always work. It's important that the TI gets to know his or her hot buttons because that's what manipulators like gang stalkers are going to push. Defense mechanisms and offensive tactics. Almost everyone is familiar with the term defense mechanism. Defense mechanisms are the automatic or unconscious mental behaviors all of us employ to protect or defend ourselves from the threat of some emotional pain. More specifically, ego defense mechanisms are mental behaviors we use to defend our self-images from invitations to feel ashamed or guilty about something. 
There are many different kinds of ego defenses and the more traditional psychodynamic theories of personalities have always tended to distinguish the various personality types, at least in part, by the type of ego defenses they prefer to use. One of the problems with psychodynamic approaches to understanding human behavior is that they tend to depict people as most always afraid of something and defending or protecting themselves in some way, even when they're in the act of aggressing. Covert aggressive personalities, indeed all aggressive personalities, use a variety of mental behaviors and interpersonal maneuvers to help ensure they get what they want. Some of these behaviors have been traditionally thought of as defense mechanisms. While from a certain perspective, we might say someone engaging in these behaviors is defending their ego from any sense of shame or guilt, it's important to realize that at the time the aggressor is exhibiting these behaviors, he is not primarily defending or attempting to prevent some internally painful event from occurring, but rather fighting to maintain position, gain power, and to remove any obstacles, both internal and external, in the way of getting what he wants. Seeing the aggressor as on the defensive in any sense is a setup for victimization. Recognizing that they're primarily on the offensive mentally prepares a person for the decisive action they need to take in order to avoid being run over. Therefore, I think it's best to conceptualize many of the mental behaviors, no matter how automatic or unconscious they may appear, that we often think of as defense mechanisms, as offensive power tactics, because aggressive personalities employ them primarily to manipulate, control, and achieve dominance over others. Rather than trying to prevent something emotionally painful or dreadful from happening, anyone using these tactics is primarily trying to ensure that something they want to happen does indeed happen. Let's take a look at the principal tactics covert aggressive personalities use to ensure they get their way and maintain a position of power over their victims. Guilt tripping. One thing that aggressive personalities know well is that other types of persons have very different consciousness than they do. Manipulators are often skilled at using what they know to be the greater conscientiousness of their victims as a means of keeping them in a self-doubting, anxious, and submissive position. The more conscientious the potential victim, the more effective guilt is as a weapon. Aggressive personalities of all types use guilt tripping so frequently and effectively as a manipulative tactic that I believe it illustrates how fundamentally different in character they are compared to other, especially neurotic personalities. All a manipulator has to do is suggest to the conscientious person that they don't care enough are too selfish, etc., and that person immediately starts to feel bad. 
on the contrary, a conscientious person might try until they're blue in the face to get a manipulator or any other aggressive personality to feel badly about a hurtful behavior, acknowledge responsibility, or admit wrongdoing to absolutely no avail. Shaming. This is the technique of using subtle sarcasm and put-downs as a means of increasing fear and self-doubt in others. Covert aggressives use this tactic to make others feel inadequate or unworthy and therefore defer to them. It's an effective way to foster a continued sense of personal inadequacy in the weaker party, thereby allowing an aggressor to maintain a position of dominance. Vilifying the victim. This tactic is frequently used in conjunction with the tactic of playing the victim role. The aggressor uses this tactic to make it appear he is only responsible or defending himself against aggression on the part of the victim. It enables the aggressor to better put the victim on the defense. Projecting the blame or blaming others. Aggressive personalities are always looking for a way to shift the blame from their aggressive behavior. Covert aggressives are not only skilled at finding scapegoats, they're experts at doing so in subtle, hard-to-detect ways. Minimization this tactic is a unique kind of denial coupled with rationalization. When using this maneuver, the aggressor is attempting to assert that his abusive behavior isn't really as harmful or irresponsible as someone else may be claiming. It's the aggressor's attempt to make a molehill out of a mountain. I've presented the principal tactics that covert aggressives use to manipulate and control others. They are not always easy to recognize. Although all aggressive personalities tend to use these tactics, covert aggressives generally use them slickly, subtly, and adeptly. Anyone dealing with a covertly aggressive person will need to heighten gut level sensitivity to the use of these tactics if they're to avoid being taken in by them. Shaming is a big part of the gang stalking process. Gang stalkers try to make you feel ashamed of everything about yourself. They want you to believe there is something wrong with you or you did something to deserve the campaign. The gang stalkers will try to make the TI think that nobody likes them, but that is simply not true. One TI overheard a gang stalker saying that nobody likes the TI, so there must be a reason that justifies it. The gang stalker also mentioned that the TI's past friends turned against the TI, so that was proof that there was something wrong with the TI. But the gang stalker conveniently left out how much the gang stalkers were involved in making people dislike the TI and their efforts towards promoting negative interactions in the TI's relationships. To illustrate my point about friends betraying the TI, let's look at what happened to Jesus. I'm not preaching a sermon or trying to convert anyone. I want to look at some incidents in Jesus' life from a strictly historical context. Jesus was an outspoken do-gooder who was pretty popular until his enemies' campaign against him started to work. His enemies had been trying to turn people against him for a while, sometimes confronting him directly in public or spreading lies among prominent figures and commoners. They started to plot ways to have him crucified and got one of his own disciples to betray him. Judas, one of his closest friends, sold him out for money. Most of his friends ran away and hid when the enemy came for Jesus. Then there was Peter who vowed to always be true to Jesus but later denied him 
three times. Peter had followed closely while Jesus was taken away. He was hanging out near where they held Jesus when some people claimed that he was one of Jesus' friends. Peter denied this every time. This was while Jesus was in his enemy's hands and could use a friend. Why did Peter betray Jesus? Simply because if he had admitted to being Jesus' friends, Jesus' enemies would have attacked him too. None of Jesus' friends stood up for him. They waited until it was too late to stand up for him. Other people, besides his friends, who were totally on his side and was on good terms with him, insulted him and completely took his enemy's side. Remember that Jesus was having problems with his family, and the enemies exploited this. So it looked like nobody liked Jesus, not even his own family. This wasn't the whole truth, but it's probably what his enemies spread to the public at the time. Now, in Jesus' case, it was a special divine plan. But in a T.I.'s case, it's just plain betrayal. Just like Jesus' enemies worked hard to turn Jesus' family, friends, and associates against him, stalkers do the same. From stalkers' cases that have been prosecuted, you can see what the stalkers did to ruin their victims' reputation and turn others against the victims. You can go to YouTube and search gang stalker tried and convicted to hear about what one stalker did to try to ruin her victim. The stalkers put in a lot of effort to make it appear as if nobody likes the T.I. If the T.I.'s friends or families turn against the T.I., the stalkers tell people who may support the T.I., hey, even his friends from childhood turned against him. There must be a good reason for it. That's how they prove that everyone else should hate the T.I. too. All the while, not telling how it came about that all these people turned against the T.I. In reality, the T.I. is not a horrible person that no one likes. No, the stalkers are horrible people who use lies, half-truths, intimidation, and manipulation to deceive the public into thinking that the T.I. is a bad person. So, T.I.s, keep your head up. Don't buy into the gang stalker's deception. Now, here are a bunch of people who will stop what they are doing to follow the T.I., get the T.I.'s attention, constantly talk about the T.I., and do the most shameful things to get to the T.I. There's a lot of energy, manpower, and effort put into a campaign. All this for someone whom the gang stalkers will say is not important, no one likes, is nothing, etc. So, if all that is true, why are the gang stalkers trying so hard to bring this person down? This much attention is not devoted to someone who doesn't matter or is nothing. And if the gang stalkers are telling the whole truth and the T.I. is truly a horrible person, then why are the gang stalkers so secretive about the information they spread? Why don't they just confront the T.I. openly and have an open discussion about their claims? Simply because the gang stalkers are liars. There is no reason for a T.I. to be ashamed or let anyone involved in the campaign make them ashamed. Take a serious look at the gang stalkers. See them for what they are and realize that what these people do is a censor onto itself. The shame belongs to the gang stalkers. Once a TI starts fighting back, they will be vilified. It is one of the purposes of the attacks. Gang stalkers want the TI to get violent so that they can keep the focus on what the TI did and not their systematic methods to manipulate the TI's actions. A way that gang stalkers try to vilify or project the blame on the TI is by using their children in gang stalking incidents. One T.I. has reported being stalked by three generations of stalkers during a shopping trip. A grandma, a mother, and a child. The mother instructed the child to repeatedly push the shopping cart into the T.I. while she looked on in approval. Because a child is doing it, the T.I. may look like the villain for getting upset, and the parent can now use this as a reason to fight or argue with the T.I. There have been much uproar about children being used as soldiers in war-torn countries. 
The motive for using child soldiers is that it's frowned upon for adults to hurt kids, which puts the adult enemy at a disadvantage. The same agenda is used by gang stalkers. Is it okay for parents to have their kids bully or deliberately disrespect adults in order to force a negative reaction? Since the campaigns are also meant to drive the TI to violence, gang stalker parents use their kids as bait and put their kids' safety at risk. TI should be aware that this can be a part of a campaign. A TI shouldn't take the bait when a child is being used and should immediately figure out ways to neutralize this tactic. It's important that each TI realizes that there is nothing wrong with the TI. There is something wrong with the people who engage in and force others to engage in these gang stalking activities. Gang stalkers are in no position to criticize anyone for any reason. What they do is one of the most shameful things ever. So you're forced into a system of unwanted pursuit? Here is an excerpt of an article from ABC News. It's called Psychiatrist. Rage comes from accumulation. Why do we get so mad over things that don't really matter? Like getting cut off in traffic by someone who's in too much of a hurry. Two reasons. Some people are just more hostile than others, and anger is often the result of cumulative insults, not a single event. It's doubtful the kind of road rage that drives one person to the brink of killing another human being is the direct result of getting cut off in traffic. William says more likely it's resulted from a whole series of events that taken together pushed someone just a bit too far. The traffic incident served as a trigger releasing hostility that had been building up for some time. In other words, someone reached a threshold and flipped out the anger sack. It's as though each of us carries a burlap bag around, storing the insults that have been hurled at us. You keep stuffing things into that gunny sack you've got on your back, and you get home and find that your mate didn't carry out an assigned chore. William says you try to put that in the gunny sack, metaphorically speaking. And the damn thing just completely burst open and it all comes spilling out. It's not that particular thing, but the built up load of all the stuff you've been trying to get out from under. This excerpt concentrates on road rage, but the concept applies to some of the goals of the campaign. The article states that it resulted from a whole series of events that, taken together, pushed someone just a bit too far. The traffic incident served as a trigger, releasing hostility that had been building up for some time. In other words, someone reached a threshold and flipped out. Gang stalkers probably try to find the TI's threshold and push past the limits so that the TI could flip out. A TI can prevent this from happening. The first step is realizing that anger is a natural emotion, and like any other emotion, it can accumulate. Anger is not one of the emotions that should build up too much unless it's being used for progressive purposes because it's extremely reactive in large amounts. There is a reason why gang stalkers try to use anger to induce mental illness. The following comes from Mental Health and Anger Management, reviewed by Jonathan L. Galfand, MD. Anger can be an underlying cause of mental health issues. Learn about the dangers of suppressed anger and steps towards managing anger. What is anger? 
Anger is a very powerful emotion that can stem from feelings of frustration, hurt, annoyance, or disappointment. It is a normal human emotion that can range from slight irritation to strong rage. What are the dangers of suppressed anger? Suppressed anger can be an underlying cause of anxiety and depression. Anger that is not appropriately expressed can disrupt relationships, affect thinking and behavior patterns, and create a variety of physical problems. Chronic long-term anger has been linked to health issues such as high blood pressure, heart problems, headaches, skin disorders, and digestive problems. In addition, anger can be linked to problems such as crime, emotional and physical abuse, and other violent behavior. What steps can I take to help manage anger? Although expressing anger is better than keeping it in, anger should be expressed in an appropriate way. Frequent outbursts of anger are often counterproductive and cause problems in relationships with others. Anger outbursts are also stressful to your nervous and cardiovascular systems and can make health problems worse. Learning how to use assertiveness is the healthy way to express your feelings, needs, and preferences. Being assertive can be used in place of using anger in these situations. If you have trouble realizing when you are having angry thoughts, keep a log of when you feel angry. Learn how to laugh at yourself and see humor in situations. Practice good listening skills. Listening can help improve communication and can facilitate trusting feelings between people. This trust can help you deal with potentially hostile emotions. Learn to assert yourself, expressing your feelings calmly and directly without becoming defensive, hostile, or emotionally charged. Consult self-help books on assertiveness or seek help from a professional therapist to learn how to use assertiveness and anger management skills. I want to highlight the statement in the article that said suppressed anger can be an underlying cause of anxiety and depression. The use of random strangers catches the TI off guard. For example, a TI can sit in a room with people whom she or he doesn't know and doesn't have any animosity towards. Some of the people in that room could be gang stalkers and some might be bystanders. Remember that gang stalkers keep their agenda hidden and the majority don't know the TI. They only know what they are told. The gang stalkers are probably hostile to the TI, but since the TI doesn't know who all the gang stalkers are, she or he will be caught off guard when the stranger suddenly becomes hostile or behaves in an invasive manner. The gang stalker usually strikes quickly and then moves away before the TI can respond or fakes innocence. The TI either can't respond because the gang stalker ran away or has to deal with the stalker who denies the incident so that the argument stays on didn't happen rather than what happened. The TI's anger is suppressed by this invalidation method. The suppressed anger is one of the things that stalkers use to induce mental illness. A TI is constantly harassed in this manner, which means that the anger can accumulate quickly if the TI is not careful. A TI who keeps a log of when she or he gets angry can better identify personal hot buttons, but the TI should keep the list in a safe place and it immediately, immediately figure out ways to prevent others from pushing those buttons. There are additional ways to manage anger which are more specific to the TI's situation. Here's the deal. With the exception of family, friends, and associates who turned against you, some people whom you don't care to ever know are destined.
desperate for your attention have decided to follow you around and harass you. They surround and suck you in to their toxic environment. They continue to use abusive methods, try to cut down your self-esteem, and drive you crazy. After they have forced you into their twisted world and hold you hostage, they have the nerve to try to shun you as if you were the one who was pursuing them. They want you to quietly take their abuse. Who wouldn't cry? Who wouldn't get upset or angry? The gang stalkers may try to make you feel bad for having these feelings, but it's clear that there is something seriously wrong with these people. Seriously wrong. If any gang stalkers are listening, please get help. You have some serious issues that cause you to engage in these activities and need to seek professional help. Back to their victims. Some of the gang stalkers seem to be angry, negative, and hostile people. They haven't found a healthy way to release their anger, so they take it out on other people. Unfortunately, they have found like-minded individuals to enable their dysfunction and make them feel okay about it, even encourage it. They will antagonize and harass you. They do it deliberately to get you angry, so it's natural that you will probably get angry. There is nothing wrong or weak about getting angry. The problem comes in when they try to manipulate you into violent or humiliating acts while you are angry. How do you deal with the constant aggravation? Here's a few tips. Take a crisis management or emergency response course. This will teach you different ways to deal with crisis. You could also take anger management courses, but those courses usually teach you how to deal with rational people who usually play by the rules. As you can see, you are dealing with ruthless people who don't care about the rules and engage in irrational behavior. It's better to take an emergency course because it teaches how to deal with irrational behavior, which is typical of emergency situations. If you do take an anger management course, make sure that it teaches you how to express anger in an effective way, not how to suppress it. Remember, causing anger is part of the campaign, so most TIs probably would not get angry without the campaigns. TIs don't necessarily have anger management issues, but could take courses just to get tips on how to handle the anger that comes with the campaigns. You can also check out um, www.videojug, all one word, dot com. That's www.videojug.com and search anger management and Michael Fisher to get some helpful tips and learn more. But watch the videos by Michael Fisher. You could also buy a punching bag and go at it while picturing the gang stalkers. Make sure that you designate the punching bag as the only place that you will allow yourself to physically vent. Meditation is also another option. A possible shortfall of meditating is that you might end up denying or ignoring your anger. There are healthy, non-violent ways to express your anger as it is. When people ignore their anger, minimize it, or deny it, it builds. That's what the gang stalkers are banking on. You not admitting to your anger until it finally explodes and they want to be there to exploit that moment. So if meditation works for you, make sure that it is allowing the full expression or outlet for your anger. Another option is crying. Crying is one of the best ways to vent anger, frustration, or upset. Babies can attest to that. Babies usually bawl while telling you all about their problems through screams or babbling and then they go to sleep and you know they sleep deep. As people get older, this is discouraged to their detriment. Crying is seen as a sign of weakness or defeat when really it is a sign that you are a human being who has feelings. Of course, gang stalkers who see a TI cry will try to make fun of it or think that they won or broke the person down. 
don't take them seriously. As you can see, these are not the most emotionally or psychologically healthy people. So unless you want to end up like them, don't listen to anything that they have to say about you expressing your feelings. They are in no place to say anything bad about anybody. So find a quiet, private spot and cry when you need to. Be careful if you decide to bawl or speak out loud about your troubles um, because of course some people are trying to convince other people that you are not well and may try to use this as proof or as the excuse. Another thing that you can do is take out your phone, call a sympathetic friend. If no one is available, talk to your answering machine or just pretend to be on the phone. Listen, it may seem strange, but if you feel as if you need to get it off your chest, then go for it. It's not crazy. Mentally ill people really believe that they are talking to someone on the other line. You, on the other hand, know there is no one on the other line and the reason for doing it. You know, you could be somewhere and the stalking is getting a bit hectic. Don't be afraid to take out your phone and, you know, say what you gotta say. But don't get on the phone and talk about gang stalking and perps because the general public isn't completely aware of it yet. Say what you need to say in a way that lets you vent, get your message across to the perps, but doesn't make you look crazy. Don't give the perps reason to make any more false accusations. Whether it's a sympathetic ear, your answering machine, or just you speaking into the phone, use your phone to effectively vent and release some of your anger. And again, know your hot buttons. These people will study you to find out what your buttons are and push them, push them, push them. That's why they seek out friends, family, ex-partners, and others who know you and try to enlist them in the campaigns or get information from them. Even if the stalkers succeed in turning some family and friends against you, don't be discouraged. Just don't let them push your buttons. Try it and send your feedback to protectlifenow at yahoo.com. Ladies and gentlemen, please find your seats and turn off or mute your cell phones, pagers, and beepers. The show is about to begin. This street theater comes from Stanford, Connecticut. I had a double dose of the most ridiculous experience while shopping at a well-known discount store. While purchasing my items, I asked the cashier a simple question. She was in her mid to late 30s and had a plastic smile with a fake foreign accent. When she gave an unnecessarily complicated answer in a loud, obnoxious voice to my simple question, I grew suspicious, but I gave her the benefit of the doubt because she had been decent. A bit phony, but decent. She asked me a question and as I was answering, she gave the gang stalking signal. I was a bit taken aback, so I asked her to do it again. She claimed to not know what I was talking about. I calmly showed her the signal and didn't say it was a gang stalking signal, but she still played dumb. I told her I was interested because it was a sign of psychopathic tendencies and she looked confused. <laughs> she said she didn't know what a psychopath was and would ask her doctor about it. I told her to look it up online and ask her doctor for a prescription. Thanked her and went about my merry way. Don't worry, I said it in a normal way. The other stalkers were nearby, of course, and uh, didn't like what happened. So, one of them followed me down six flights of stairs and into the streets. He was probably in his late 20s. He was short, had a shirt with the number five on it. He caught up with me and asked me when the mall closed, and I told him to go look himself. Hmm. He told me he was just asking me a question and trying to make me feel bad about not having a car. He said, that's why you're walking. How did he know I didn't have a car? I pointed out that he was also walking. He turned around and proudly showed me his car keys. I asked him if having a car made him better than other people. 
He said no, but it made him friendly. <laughs> he told me that I should be friendly, just like him. Of course, what was I thinking? I should sign up to be a gang stalker so I can meet innocent people, nominate them for campaigns, ruin their relationship, harass them, then celebrate their demise with my stalking buddies. You can't get any friendlier than that. Damn, I should have asked him if that number five was his gang stalking number or his IQ score. Now it's time for TI News. I'm always looking for news stories about stalking, especially gang stalking. So if you find a news story that appeared in an official news source, please email it to protectlifenow at yahoo.com. So here's the news for today. This news story comes from Everett, Washington. It's called Stalking on the Rise with Technology. The web, text messaging, and GPS devices make it easier for stalkers to intimidate victims. She has moved four times in the past two years. It only takes him a couple of weeks to find her again. He follows her home from work, she suspects. The Snohomish County mother has wired the outside of her house with surveillance cameras. An alarm in her bedroom is triggered if exterior motion sensor lights are tripped. She keeps a baseball bat within reach while she sleeps. She is afraid of her former boyfriend. She believes he has stolen her clothes, slashed her tires, left her hundreds of voicemails, and watched her since she broke up with him. He has been convicted four times of breaking a court order to stay away from her. He spent two days in jail. Now he faces a misdemeanor stalking charge. I didn't ask for this, I just left, the mother said. I want to live a normal life, be able to put food on the table for my kids and not have to do a 35 point inspection on my car or wonder what he's going to do next. The Herald is not naming the woman to protect her identity. Domestic violence experts say 1.4 million women and men are stalked each year. The number of victims is expected to climb as technology, such as the internet and global positioning systems, become more accessible and make it easier for perpetrators to harass, intimidate, and threaten victims around the clock. The internet is a new access point to victims. It opens up a whole new realm of stalking. Online websites can pinpoint an exact location of where a person lives, and perpetrators can access private information. It can make life hell, said Sandy Bromley, senior program attorney with the Stalking Resource Center, a project of the National Center for Victims of Crime. Threatening emails, text messages, or postings on a person's MySpace webpage may seem harmless, but it can escalate to violence, said Danielle Singson, domestic violence coordinator for the Mount Lake Terrace Police Department. The majority of victims of domestic violence related homicides were stalked before they were murdered, she said. Stalkers generally don't go away. The crime escalates or they get fixated on someone else, Singson said. Parents also must be aware of the use of technology to stalk young people who have access to the internet and cell phones. Police have even seen stalkers use the messaging capability found in some online multiplayer video games to harass and intimidate young people. Technology can make a stalker bold. They may be more aggressive than they would be face to face, said Snohomish County Deputy Prosecutor Hallie Hupp. People get on the computer and think they're hidden. Hupp recently prosecuted a woman for the felony stalking of her former co worker. Susan Orozco was sentenced to 10 months in prison. She sent degrading flyers to the victim's neighbors, her children, other co workers, and potential employers. Orozco also set up two websites containing derogatory information about the victim, Hupp said. Hupp believes prosecutors and police will see more cases of people using the internet to stalk victims. Unfortunately, the technology can make it more difficult to prove someone has broken the law. The incidents can cross numerous jurisdictions, requiring police departments to work together to prove that there is a pattern of harassments or threats. It can also be more difficult for police to prove who sent a threatening email. A more traditional stalker may leave behind physical evidence such as fingerprints or saliva on an envelope or piece of paper. Technology such as text messaging would adapt itself well to a person's obsessive behavior, said Norm Nelson, a domestic violence counselor and owner of the Snow King Counselors LLC, a Linwood Counseling Center. Stalking often starts as a person's need to know where their partner is at all times, he said. 
They're trying to satisfy non-specific fears around the relationship. They're in fear of losing the relationship or they need to control the relationship, Nelson said. The stalker may believe that checking up on their partner four or five times a day is rational. He is convinced that it shows how much he loves her, Nelson said. Domestic violence experts say it is important that victims of stalking don't ignore or minimize the risk. Oftentimes, victims don't report stalking incidents or the police treat it as a different crime such as telephone harassment or vandalism. That can make investigating a stalking case difficult because police must show a pattern of harassment, threats, or intimidation, said Megan Sweeney, the domestic violence coordinator of the Linwood Police Department. Sweeney and others from the South Snohomish County Domestic Violence Task Force are planning a community training session later this month. They hope the training will help people understand what stalking is and what can be done to get help. Victims don't want to report that their underwear is missing or the front door was opened sometime overnight, Sweeney said. It's hard to report that. They worry that no one will believe them. Sweeney remembers one victim became extremely frustrated before police finally took his complaints about an ex-girlfriend seriously. He made several reports before the woman was eventually arrested for stalking. A good number of cases are under investigated, Bromley said. Stalking is a course of conduct, an ongoing pattern of behavior. There has to be quite a bit of investigation that goes into it, she said. The Snohomish County woman, who must keep moving to avoid her tormentor, learned how to keep a stalking log detailing thefts, vandalism, and threats she believes are the work of her ex-boyfriend. Sometimes she calls 911. Police officers don't always take reports, she said. Other times, she doesn't bother calling. She's afraid she'll look like an idiot. I sit down and read the paperwork and wonder if I'm losing my mind. I'm worn out, she said. The worst part is people always look at you like it's your fault. How do you prove that he is responsible for disconnecting her car's battery or stuffing dirt in the gas tank? Or that he pressed his face up against the window and left the print? Or that he left three dozen voicemails where he said nothing, just played the song Every Breath You Take? Sting singing the refrain, I'll be watching you over and over. The woman hasn't always found help. She often must pay to repair vandalism to her vehicles or replace property stolen from her house. She worries that the torment will never stop. She wonders where she'll get the money to keep going on this way. She can't be sure that he won't turn violent. I like to say that there's a light at the end of the tunnel, but I'm not convinced there is, she said. Some of the reasons the gang stalkers are bold is because of the support that they receive from other gang stalkers, especially the prominent gang stalkers, and the law enforcement agencies ignore or overlook the crime. Whether single or gang stalking, victims don't get enough assistance and often are left to deal with the stalking crime on their own. It's time for preventative methods to stalking rather than law enforcement officials waiting until it's too late then giving a public apology for doing nothing. This encourages stalkers and encourages stalking. It's time to stop making stalkers feel safe instead of the victim. This news report is called, Though Many Are Stalked, Few Report It. When Vernon E. Miller was sentenced for stalking last November, cell phone records show that he had made 3,788 calls to his former girlfriend in a single month. He rang her doorbell repeatedly for months, the police said, and he had been seen peeking in her window. Mr. Miller had pleaded guilty to stalking the woman but asked that he receive no jail time. It is a crime of being in love with someone and no one else in the world to turn to, Mr. Miller, 40, told Judge John M. Cassio of the Court of Common Pleas of Somerset County, Pennsylvania, at his sentencing. He begged for a little compassion because his girlfriend had found somebody else. But the judge, noting that Mr. Miller, formerly of Cumberland, Maryland, had been accused of similar behavior before, sent him to the county jail. Whether they are obsessed fans fixating on celebrities or former romantic partners, stalkers like Mr. Miller typically invoke spurned love, real or imagined, to defend their actions. But stalkers seldom have to justify their behavior in the legal system because only one in three cases is ever reported to the authorities, according to a Justice Department study released last month. The report was the first in-depth federal look at the prevalence of stalking, which is a crime in all 50
safety states. While many people tend to associate stalking with the pursuit of stars like Uma Thurman and David Letterman, researchers found that 3.4 million people were subjected to stalking, defined as a course of conduct that would cause a reasonable person to feel fear. Women were more often the victims than men. And 11%, about 374,000 people, had been stalked for five or more years. And then there were those like Cameron Wallace of New Franklin, Ohio, who endured the terrifying experience far longer. Miss Wallace, now 28, was in her sophomore year of high school in 1996 when she sat next to Ryan Clutter in art class. Although they never dated or were even friends, he began turning up just about everywhere she went. For the next 11 years, he appeared at her house or at the mall, sat behind her at the movies, sent demands by email, and threatened her life. He described how he would kill her. He was going to gut me, she said in an interview this month, still tearful. Yet, she said, the police told her that it was hard to connect all his actions and that he had denied them. They could not act until he did something more serious, Ms. Wallace said. Three quarters of victims know their stalker, whether it is a current or former friend, roommate, or neighbor. This study and others have found. Often stalkers want to make their victims fearful, said Eugene A. Regala, a former FBI profiler who advises on workplace threats. They are thinking, how dare you do this to me? I'm going to make you pay. But others feel it could be a way of getting back into the relationship. Experts say only a small number of stalking incidents reach the courts because cases are often difficult to compile. There's often no clear physical evidence linking a stalker to the victim. In the Justice Department study, the most common reason for respondents not telling the police they were being stalked was that they felt it was a personal matter or they did not think that the police would think it was important. Stalking is treated like domestic violence was 20 or 25 years ago, said Mary Lou Leary, executive director of the National Center for Victims of Crime and a former federal prosecutor. Law enforcement is often suspicious or cynical, but is now beginning to deal with stalking as a crime. Many victims initially refuse to believe or accept that a former partner is singling them out for retaliation. It is a shock for others when a stranger begins to constantly annoy or follow them. Many people told us they were uneasy, felt creeped out, or scared, said Katrina Baum, a Bureau of Justice Statistics researcher and an author of the study. There is a reluctance to label the behavior because it's too frightening. At some point, the behavior can escalate to where it cannot be ignored. Ms. Wallace said that at first I didn't realize how serious it was, but after she married in 1999, Mr. Clutter called at 1 a.m. and said I had 30 days to get out of the house or he would kill me and my husband, she recalled. That's when I really started getting scared. Most states passed laws after the stalking and killing of a television actress, Rebecca Schaefer, in 1989. A first offense is usually deemed a misdemeanor. Punishment varies by state, but can include up to a year in jail, a fine, probation, and counseling. In 34 states, stalking is a felony only upon a second offense or when coupled with an aggravating factor, like possession of a deadly weapon. Confounding the victim's plight is that some states also limit protective orders to relatives or spouses. Miss Wallace was finally able to get a protective order in Ohio against Mr. Clutter in 2003 but he did not stop pounding her. Three years later, he broke into her house and then by email sent her a photograph he had taken of her sleeping. When the police searched his apartment, they found a kind of shrine to Miss Wallace with stolen articles of her clothing. There was also a 45 caliber handgun, a computer with his threatening email messages, and more than 3,000 images of child pornography. Convicted of stalking and other charges in 2007, he is serving a 13-year prison sentence. One reason Ms. Wallace and other victims have difficulty pulling together a case is that stalking is often confused with harassment, a less serious behavior. Dr. Park Dietz, a Southern California forensic psychiatrist, said the behavior crosses the line when it includes lying in wait, following, or breaking in. Dr. Dates, who helps corporations address stalking and other threats, said that treating stalking as a misdemeanor is useless because it angers offenders and makes them more dangerous, adding, it's like poking a wild animal with a stick. Strengthened victim protection in states like Kansas now allows the police to investigate reports of reasonable fear for one's safety rather than the stricter requirement of a credible threat. 
The state has Jody's Law, named after Jody Sanderholm, a 19-year-old college student who was kidnapped, raped, and strangled in January 2007. The suspect, Justin E. Thurber, was found guilty on Thursday on charges of capital murder and aggravated kidnapping. The Somerset District Attorney, Jerry L. Spangler, said incarceration in cases like Mr. Miller's was not enough. Stalkers also require individualized treatment, he said. Mr. Miller's lawyer did not return calls for comment. They almost never admit something is wrong with them, said Barry Rosenfeld, a psychology professor and director of clinical training at Fordham University, who has evaluated dozens of stalkers. Stalkers often feel bad, lonely, and vulnerable, Dr. Rosenfeld said. Then they'll call even though there is a protection order saying that they can't do it. They won't get an answer, and they'll call again. Dr. Rosenfeld is testing a more intensive program to help offenders learn to better control their need to do something to feel better in the moment. After a decade of suffering electronic tempering of her credit card bills, computer and bank accounts, as well as phone threats and vandalism, Karen Welch of New Jersey, a chief financial officer for a nonprofit group, pushed to overhaul the state stalking law. I don't want a Karen's law that gives more protection after it's too late, Ms. Welch said. I want the law broadened so it protects victims against emotional distress or significant mental suffering, not just when a person fears for her safety. The bill passed and is awaiting the governor's signature, according to its sponsor, State Senator Barbara Bono, a Democrat. In Ohio, Ms. Wallace testified for legislation to electronically monitor stalkers so victims and the police know when they approach. Ms. Wallace said she expected the law, which was going into effect this April, to save many lives and possibly my own after Ryan is released from prison. If the law enforcement officials are lax about stalking or ignore it, victims are not likely to report it. In this way, Law enforcement officials inadvertently discourage victims from reporting stalking. That's it for this episode. I gave you the information. Now you decide how to use it. Use what works for you. If you would like to share your stalking story with Tenani, please check out the Protect Life Now's organized harassment video on YouTube or email protectlifenow at yahoo.com for more information. If any gang stalkers disagree with the information presented, please let us know. We would love to hear from you. Thank you for listening, and I'll talk to you next time.